finishes the videoing on the 24th of uh, July, Sunday evening, five minutes to eight. Robin and John, uh, John Page, two of our benefactors. No, is he? <laughs> um, oh, certainly didn't do, do much sales, really. Um, I'm really Bram! I mean, it could be down the road. It's not the right place, <laughs> no, I nearly read it. Gordon. Gordon has been here several times before lost I don't really have to tell you about so far, I'm sure, but isn't it marvellous to have a success story within conservation? We hear so much doom and gloom and we're so despondent, but we must be positive. And I think when you look at Bird's Farm, you can see a positive action. Obviously from Robin leading and all his friends, but really the general public. It's the general public which we definitely need. You don't have to be an expert, it's just you need the love of the natural world. So thank you very much indeed. I'll pass you over to Robin to carry on this marvellous day. Another success story. Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah, I would like to briefly tell you what, what we've done since the Countryside Restoration Trust um, was started about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. Um, we've, we've raised over £100,000, um, we've got nearly a thousand members, uh, and you're standing on the, on the first um, land purchase of the Trust, uh, 22 acres. You can see we've divided it up. We're still, having, we're still having cereals on one side because we want to show people how to farm profitably. And if you think it's weedy around the edges, um, that is because it has not been sprayed on purpose um, so that we have an edge of wildflowers where insects and young birds can thrive. Then along the middle you can see that we've planted a hedge 500 yards long and several people here actually helped with that planting. And then over the gate uh, we've got um, traditional hay meadow mixture planted that was pioneered by Miriam Rothschild um, which is very exciting. We just mown it to get rid of the old cereal crops, um, weeds. And then the brook itself, where a meander has been restored, uh, and it's, I can say it because you're all friends and you're all sensible people, it's this strip of the Bourne Brook is one of the um, busiest um, for the Cambridgeshire otters that have just returned. And, and there are usually otter sprints under this bridge and also under the bridge on the A603. Uh, so it has been a, a success story. We've, we've done on a small scale in 12 months what we hope to do on a much bigger scale later on because we want to um, buy a complete farm that has been ruined by intensive agriculture and we want to bring it back with hedges, with good crops, with birdsong and butterflies. Now it is my very great privilege to have here with us today um, Sir Lawrence van der Post. He's been a great um, source of, of inspiration and help to me over a number of years. Um, as soon as I asked him to be a, a trustee of the
the Countryside Restoration Trust. He accepted straight away without any query, um, without any reservation. Um, and if I, I, it's wrong to pick out people, but Gordon here has, has been a great help. We've been arguing with conservation bodies for well over 10 years about the general countryside and not islands for conservation. And Gordon has joined me at the RSPB telling them that it's about time they stopped having reserves and worried about birds in the general countryside. So when the Countryside Restoration Trust um, came up in my mind, Gordon was a great help and Lawrence was a great help too and an inspiration in his writing and in the way that he um, has, has been leading us all um, for several years. There are other people here who also need to mention because they have been local and working hard. Andrew Edwards is a trustee, he is there. Badger Walker is, is there in the white shirt. You don't often see him looking smart. Um, he's on the management committee uh, and he's an expert hedge layer. If any of you go to our farm experimental <laughs> meadow and see the, the hedge that has been laid there, um, he did it. Ken Gifford with the very badly dressed, I, I regret to say. Um, he has been the treasurer uh, for a year, I do wish he'd smarted himself up. Um, it's appalling. Uh, but without Ken, the trust would have been in, uh, in very dire straits. Uh, Margaret Taylor is through there. She's our first paid employee. She's the trust secretary. And Pat Gifford in there, she was secretary for a whole year, um, working very hard the wife of Ken and she did a lot of work um, as well as her job as school secretary and then we've got John Hawker here who is another trustee. Before I hand over to Lauren, I would like Lauren um, to give this bouquet um, to Pat Gifford. Uh, she's worked very hard for a year. Uh, she's now stopped being secretary because we needed somebody full time and this is a token of thanks for all the work she's done over the last year. And now I'll ask uh, uh, Lawrence to um, open this uh, kiss gate in due course and say a few words to us. And I do thank him for coming all the way to London uh, today to be with us. Lawrence. Thank you. After Lawrence. <laughs> and all these young ladies will be queuing up. <laughs> Do you? Because I do Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can you all hear me if I speak like this? You wouldn't all like to come a bit closer. Why should we stand away from it? Because I know my voice uh, is reputed not to carry. Uh, my father-in-law once said to me, he'd known me for 30 years and never heard a word I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I would hate that to happen between us this morning. Also, I've got something here I might like to read to you. I think what you've done today and what Robin has done is of immense importance. I've been one way and another uh, concerned of what is broadly called conservation, uh, and in particular there was something called the Wilderness Leadership Trust. One used to think in those days in terms of leaders. One always think a nation needed leaders, it couldn't go anywhere. And one used to think in conservation, we want to train the leaders. But it's gradually dawned upon me that uh, that kind of concept of life is out of date. We've moved into an area of life where we have to realize that leaders as leaders are no good. They are there for certain functions and people, but in the world of the spirit, in the world of vision, in the world of reforming and preventing the destruction of the earth and the planet, what we've got to do is the greatest battle in which mankind has ever been engaged 
It's no good waiting for leaders. We've got to lead ourselves. And what I like and love about this in particular is here, and you, you've led yourselves. Robin started it. It always takes one person to start it. But then other people start it with them. And you lead by what you do, by the example you set. And I find this example of immense, not only local, but of world significance. Because this is how we have to re-begin. Re-begin small. Because everything in life that's important really starts in a small way. We have the view, I, particularly I find in wilderness, I've had to fight. Because they say we want money. And they appoint fundraisers who, fundraisers who for 60 or 100,000 pounds consume all the funds that they are supposed to be raising. <laughs> and they, do it, they want to do it in large numbers. It doesn't work. But it works this way. This way that you've started today. This farm that Robin is talking about, this dilapidated farm, well, practically every farm in mice uh, almost now, it may not be dilapidated outside, but it's dilapidated inside in its spirit because it's farming the land the wrong way. It's getting as much as it can out of the land and give back as little as possible. But here is the idea of the infinite, the age-old partnership between man and the earth, which is restored. I am uh, coming from Africa. I'm talking to you. No, you're not, Lawrence. Not I'm long here. enough. Uh, coming, no, we coming, can do with another hour. <laughs> coming, coming from Africa, as I, I did. I remember standing on the deck of a ship in the early morning um, in the Solent. And for the first time, in the early light of a very cold winter's morning, seeing the landscape of Britain for the first time. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that there could be so much green on Earth. Well, we have grass in my part of Africa. We loved the grass. It was precious. And grass is terribly important to us. We love it in a way that you love it. We haven't got it. And I thought, my God, this is wonderful. And I remember I had an expression. I thought of watching, always watching the burning landscapes of Africa and looking at the screen. I said I had a feeling as if my eyes were being put to rest, as if this is the vision it had longed for. And in the lifetime in which I've known um, um, Great Britain, which is this I'm talking now, when I, this morning, in 1928, I've seen how this green has been threatened. I've seen in a kind of little country town on the east coast in Suffolk, where we have a little house, and where we have this thing called marshes. I've seen those wonderful marshes. And in, when I knew it, in October, in September, uh, the whole village went out picking mushrooms and they put them in barrels and they pickled it and sent them to London. You wouldn't find a mad mushroom on those marshes today. How the marshes have deteriorated, how they've lost their grass. They used to be wonderful. You used to have otters, the geese used to breed and nest and the duck, and it was full of life in the summer. You couldn't, you walked across it, you couldn't hear. You, you couldn't speak to your companions because of the skylarks. And uh, I've seen all that, but worst of all, they started drying it up and putting it down to arable. And soon, to my horror, they were not even bothering to plough it. Uh, they were burning the straw. They didn't cut the straw. They just burnt it when they, uh, when they had combined harvested it. And the place looked like the retreat from Dunkirk in the summer with the clouds of smoke and flame standing high over the place. And now, in the last ten years, I've seen a phenomenon which I thought is impossible in England. I saw dust. I see dust. I see dust erosion. Well, all this has got to be stopped. I would go on saying that this is a way of doing it. And when one looks at the grasses of Great Britain, as I do, I think you know, just I didn't realize how the grasses of Great Britain were a marvelous expression, expression of the partnership between man and nature. Because the grasses aren't just as nature put them there. Because you know, people have got to love the grass and feel maybe we can, we can bring other grasses to it. And they built up a combination of grasses 
and clothes us and things we played. The meadows and the fields of Great Britain, not only sites of beauty, not only something in which nature participated with great joy, but they made them great accomplishment, uh, of nourishment, not only of man, but of, of, of natural life, of butterflies, of birds. And, it, and nature was rejoicing in it, instead of looking sad about it as it is today. And I've got, I think I must stop now, and I want to, just want to thank you all, because I'm, this is a, remember, uh, this is a terribly, terribly important uh, thing that you've done today. And when Swift talked about and said that he who makes one of the things that the man who before, that, uh, they, you know, does something for life, an act of enormously important creation. And uh, the human example, the impact, above all, of the grasses and the fields of it, to the mind of man, this green growth to the mind of man is of infinite importance. I think of a very great man who happened to be a countryman of mine called General Smuts, who um, loved same, the impact of the grasses of England, had the same thing, impact on him. And it started a lifelong courtship between him and the grasses and the plants of the world. And at Cambridge, um, Walt Whitman's first book of poems came out, Leaves of Grass. And as a, uh, a person who got a double-double first at Cambridge, here where we stand, he knew these grasses. I'm mentioning him because these grasses fed his mind. He had uh, leaves of grass with him all through his life. And through two, three great wars, he went to war, and in his saddlebags, one saddlebag, he had Kant's critique of Puri's philosophy, which was a spiritual form of grass. And in the other bag, he had written some He never drew his fist for once. Other people shot and killed, and he had to command them. But up to the end of his days, when he was on the point of retiring at the age of 80, and when he had done and fought in all these wars, his last mission was. And the last great message he left to his country was of the importance of grass. So here, I think I've come to the point when I have to undo the ribbon, and I would like to, um, if I have a chance before I go mad at all the kissing that I intend to <laughs> pursue, uh, there's something I really about grasses which is uh, so important. If you're not too tired under the sun and so on, I'd like to read. You think I have time to yes, read? Could you bear it? <laughs> because it's uh, some, some, something written by um, a person an English person who became a great traveller. He wrote a wonderful book of travel called Journey into Oceania, which was a new form of travel and it's a great passage. And uh, he would have gone very far as a writer and uh, an explorer of the mind in a new way. But he was killed in the war when his ship was torpedoed in 1941. But he wrote down something which sums up what I feel is the, the other side of, uh, of uh, the purely pragmatic and practical approach to the side that we care about, the nourishment which what you are doing here today to the mind and spirit of man. And how he left that vision, would have left that vision to a son if it had one. And I'll just try and read it out to you all now. You must be a little bit patient with me because um, I, 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 really, I think I can, yes. It's called, he's called, it's a man called Robert Byron. You see, there was a Byron who swam here that we talked about. So this is what is called nowadays rationally in physics and psychology a great synchronicity. And this is what Robert Byron notes. If I have a son, he shall salute the lords and ladies who unfurl green hoods to the march rains, and shall know them afterwards by their scarlet fruit. He shall know the celandine and the frigid, sightless flowers of the wind woods, spurge and spurge, laurel, dog's mercury, wood sorrel, 
and wherefore leaved her Paris fair fit to trim a bonnet with its purple dot. We shall see from the marches, marshes gold the flags and king's cup, and fine shepherd's purse on a slag heap. We shall know the tree flowers, scented lime dust, blood pink larch tufts, white strands of the Spanish chestnut, and tattered oak wood. We shall know orchids, mauve winged bees, and claret coloured flies climbing up from mottled leaves. We shall see June red and white witch ragged robin, and cow parsley and the two camp. He shall know the field flowers, ladies' bed straw, and ladies' slipper, purple, mallow, blue chicory, and the cranes' bills, dusky, bloody, and blue as heaven. In the cool summer wind, he shall listen to the castle of hairbirds against the whistle. He shall watch clever blush and scabious knot, pinch the ample vetches and savour the virgin turf. He shall know grasses, timothy and wagwanton, and dust the fingertips in Yorkshire, in Yorkshire fog. By the river he shall know pink widow herb and purple spikes of loose stripe, and the sweet sharp smell of water mint where the rat dives silently from its hole. He shall know the velvet leaves and the yellow spike of the old dowager, mother, and recognize the whole company of thistles, and greet the relatives of the nettle, woundwort, and horsehound, yellow tattle, betony, bugle, and archangel. In autumn, he shall know the hedge lanterns, hips, and halls, and briar. At Christmas he shall climb an old apple tree for mistletoe and know where to kiss and howl. It's a morning. <laughs> he shall know the butterflies that have suffered with the branches, common whites and marble white, orange tips, brimstone, and the carnivorous child in the He shall dance fully lace, pearl bordered and silver white like fireballs across the sunlit drives. We shall see the family of, of, of caper flowers, peacock, painted lady, and emperor, and all that have trumpets to suck blood from blues. While the purple emperor and white admiral blew themselves on the bowels of their rabbit. He shall know the jagged comma, printed with a white sea, the manx-tailed and iridescent, hair streaks, and the skipper's demure as charwoman on Monday morning. <laughs> he shall run on the glint of silver on a chalk full of blue, the glint of breeze on the open sky, and shall follow the brown mixed yellow brown, brown arms, speckled wood. He shall see the death and revolution on the burnt moth, black and red, crawling from a house of yellow, tail tied halfway up to a tall grass. He shall know more rational moths, who like the night, the gaudy tigers, cream spot and scarlet, and the red and the yellow underwings. He shall hear the hummingbird hawk, moth arrive like an air raid on the garden at dusk, and know the other hawks, pink, sleek, bodied elephant, bumper, lion, and today's head. He shall count the, 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 the pinions of the blue moths, and find the large emerald waiting in the rain dew grass. All these I learnt when I was a child. And each records a place on the occasion that might otherwise be lost. They were my own discoveries. They taught me to look at the world with my own eyes and with attention. They gave me a first con con content 
They gave me the first content, context with the universe. Town dwellers lack this intimate content, but my son shall not lack it. And I think a lot of people will not lack it because of what you're doing here today. Thank you. Can you just look at me, sir, before you actually pull it? Here we go. I said, just hold the ribbon. Here we go. Look at me, sir. Right. What I'd like you to do, actually, is to walk through the yes, gate. Yes. That's lovely. Then I need to go. Yes. And now, if you can just stay with the gate. No. Stay with it. Stay with it. Fine, just look up here, sir, now. That's brilliant. That's super. Thank you. Can you give him another? So yes, make sure you want to Yes, I have, Lawrence. Because your mother would like to read. Yes, so you can have your copy. Yes, yes, Jane. Uh, Jane sent it to me. Yes. Do you want a nice green ribbon to remind you of this day, Lawrence? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the printer? 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 Okay, you can just walk through the gate, Pat. What are you doing with that great big thing on his shoulder? And wear him out. Sarah?
Her smile. Hard work, Ken. It's too hard. Oh, I've got something cool on my neck. And you are? Just a wasp, don't worry. Are you a relation? Yes. Are you? Yeah, I'm his niece. Are you? Yeah. Or at least I'm married to him. Okay, that's lovely. But I've worked for him for 12 years.